Rescued is a podcast of conversations with rescuers and those who've been rescued. It's about the lessons we learn about ourselves, the places we go and why, without judgment, to help us have better adventures, manage risk and deal with the unexpected. In what must be the most basic of human fears, James woke up to find himself buried alive. Outside, the wind buffeted the main range, out past Mount Kosciuszko, but all was quiet inside his cosy white snow cave. In this episode of Rescued, we hear from James and his mate Dylan as they talk about their two very different experiences of this epic backcountry adventure and how escape was just the beginning. So let's kick it off. It's the first time I've ever had two people here in the podcast together. So uh, it's great to have James and Dylan here in the Rescued podcast studio with me, well, virtually online. And let's start by how you guys know each other. How did you guys get to become mates to find yourselves out on an adventure? And I'll start with James. Dylan and I met during Cert 4, during outdoor recreation at uh, the Blue Mountains TAFE. We weren't in the same year group. Dylan was like half offset to me. So we only lined up on a few different courses. We both had completed our certificate three in outdoor recreation and then landed together on this uh, skiing course as part of our certificate four. And uh, yeah, staggered in terms of where we did it, but that was the one bit that we overlapped for a number of weeks. Got it. Got it. So, I mean, that course sounds amazing. Why did you guys do that course? Like, James, what did, when you started the, the certificate three and four in that outdoor rec, what was your end goal? What were you hoping to do? I didn't really have much of an end goal after at the end of high school in general. So they did, there was a certificate three offered down in Sydney. So I, I did that course and just, yeah, the Cert 4 was only offered in the Blue Mountains. So me and a bunch of three other friends that did the Cert 3 course moved up to Wentworth Falls and we did the Cert 4 course. And So how old were you at the time? I went straight from high school into Cert 3, 18, 19, 20. Yeah, and Dylan? I think I was 24. In 2005, uh, the years I've had a few more years on James. Let's go to the snow component of this course. So, talk me through some of the the skills that you learnt going into those five weeks in the snow. It was a pretty. I mean, it was an intense course. It, it's a, like an extreme environment, essentially. Like it's bushwalking and it's it's cold and it's freezing and there's no. There can be just relentless out there. There's no. You can't just hide from it you learn how to recognize your limits and how to stop before you get there and do you think that's why they did that oh yeah i guess i've always just assumed that's 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 what they were doing i don't know so apart from the the experience we're going to talk about in detail what are the other memories um dylan that you have of that time in in jindy and down at the snow the three weeks that we were out as a class um in the bush uh, we experienced uh, uh, quite a variety of weather conditions and snow conditions, and we had people with quite significant injuries who left the program and then came back a few days later with various treatments and things. So it was an excellent opportunity to um, push yourselves, but with really experienced instructors who made sure that it was at your limit, not um, beyond it, adventure, not misadventure. And it was done really well. So let's jump to this day when you parked your car at Dead Horse Gap. And just for for all of us, can you just explain where Dead Horse Gap is in relation to, to some other sort of um, places that people might be familiar with? Uh, so Dead Horse Gap is sort of mountain pass, I guess, behind Threadbow. Dead Horse is the ridge of the main range as well, right? It's the closest you can drive, I guess, to get to like the main range mm. other than like coming at sh- from that Guthrie side of the valley. And what kind of um, preparation and planning did you do to prepare for, for this? And, or was it right on the back of, you know, you, you finished a, a face-to-face class the day before and then, you know, the next day out you go? The preparation that we undertook for this uh, adventure was that we uh, looked at the forecast as long as we could in advance because, you know, leaving technology behind, you can only look so far in advance uh, to see what that could be. And we were planning on being out for beyond the four-day window that the forecasts were reliable at the time. So we had a a variety of devices for communications and safety and things. So we had our mobile phone at least a GPS uh, for locations, which um, if you get a whiteout, it's a nice thing to have. A satellite phone and a PLB were four 
devices that we had. And you got to remember, this is 18 years ago. So the technology was very different. We didn't have GPSs on our phones and we didn't have um, satellite messaging services. Sat phones were quite bulky um, and mobile phones were very rudimentary. You could play Snake and send a text message was kind of like the the boundaries of the technology. So it sounds like, okay, you had you had technology, you had your food. How many days were you seeing yourselves going out for? It had been at least five or six days, right? I vaguely recall the five-day loop and return to Dead Horse Gap was amended fairly quickly once we, we headed up onto the main range. So, James, tell me about that. Tell me about, uh, so you've, you've uh, left your car at Dead Horse Gap and you got your skis on and you're heading up. What, what happened next? Uh, well, I, I definitely underestimated how much worse it gets above the tree line. I think mm. I don't I don't remember what the weather forecast forecast was but we were going out regardless so we ascended the ridge of Dead Horse Gap and we got above the tree line and we were just cruising onto the Rams Head sort of range and the wind was just unrelenting <laughs> you just you could not look into the wind so tell me about the wind dylan how was it affecting the way you were able to move about it started with sort of being uh you know coming onto a ridge and going oh that's a bit breezy to uh to the point where we were being blown over by gusts of wind um being blown off the ridge um really struggling to make progress and then having limited communication between us you sort of have to huddle up and make a wind break to be able to look at your map and things like that. And so, James, what was your what were your plans for um, how you would stay overnight? Were you planning to sleep in tents or what was the sort of sleeping accommodation ideas? During the course, I fell in love with snow caves and igloos and that part of the adventure, I guess. I, I packed a shovel and I feel like Dylan had a mega mid. Worst case, that's big enough I can squeeze in there if it push comes to shove. Otherwise, I'm digging a snow cave or an igloo. Yeah. So, tell me about um, what you learned about digging a cave for the night in the snow. I guess the basic principles are like a snow cave is easy to dig when you've got like the side of a hill that you can sort of dig into. Uh, in Australia, you, you generally need, you know, looking for quite deep snow, which means you're often looking for, I guess, the lee side of the hill where snow is sort of being, de- extra additional snow is being deposited. You would think that they are cold, but they're actually extremely well insulating inside it can be really warm and it's going to be really quiet and you're going to have a much better sleep than if you're in in a tent was my personal opinion and as long as you keep your door clear they don't have a limit for snow loading like a tent after about 10 or 10 or 20 centimeters of snow in a tent your tent fabrics touching your face so take me through to the afternoon when you realized you needed to actually start um, making plans for for the night that we're going to talk about. After the wind had abated somewhat, we skied up onto Mount Kosciuszko. Uh, we spent some time with a young couple who proposed to each other while um, just before we'd arrived or just after. Um, and so, you know, help them take a photo and um, share their bubbly, things like that. And then skied down to um, a safety hut that's nearby Mount Kosciuszko called Seaman's Hut and uh, spent a night camping near there. After leaving Seaman's Hut, we went to Charlotte's Pass to get an update on the weather and then headed off to Blue Lake. Right. And for those of us who aren't familiar with the area, talk me through what Blue Lake is and describe how it looks. It's like a... Well, I think all the lakes up there, like Club Lake and Blue Lake, it's like an amphitheatre of snow. Like, yeah, you've just got this awesome, you know, big sort of flat snow sort of field heading into this wall of snow and rocks and the rock and ice. And it actually starts to look like mountains, which is a rarity in Australia. And what, what kind of altitude are we at here? <laughs> I mean, the tops of the peaks on that ridge above the lakes are around the 2,100 metres, 2,200 metres. Yeah, in, the, in that kind of ballpark. So the lakes, I think, are sitting at about... 1800 meters the afternoon is is steadily approaching you're over the back end of of blue lake and you're you're starting to think about setting up somewhere for the night what's what are some of the choices and the things that are going through your head at that time dylan 
making our way towards Blue Lake. We briefly headed up to the lake to have a look, but as the sun was starting to get low, we thought it was a good time to go set up camp. And so we descended again onto the lee side, um, sort of just just out of the wind, um, which wasn't too bad, just just out of the breeze. So we'd have a calm camp uh, and set up uh, at camp that night. And what are you looking for apart from, um, you know, something out of the out of the wind? Anything else? We were looking for a place that was relatively out of the wind and um, flat. But other than that, we didn't have too many requirements. Uh, James, on the other hand, planning to sleep in um, snow shelters, was again looking for those things that he'd mentioned earlier, which were a, a lee side slope with a depth of snow that he could dig into to make um, a, a snow shelter. And the type of snow shelter that he built that night i think you would describe i think it's called a coffin it's a it's a very small shelter which involves digging sideways into the slope and digging a, a bench that you um sleep on i like to i like to call prefer to call it a bench or a shelf coffin a bench or a shelf co- <laughs> <laughs> the coffin's way more ominous <laughs> <laughs> so talk to me about can you remember James as you you know picked up your shovel to start you know that first that first dig into the snow what what you were trying to achieve I mean the the weather was just beautiful like it was blue skies you know the forecast was looking good so I really didn't feel like I needed much of a shelter or much of a cave and I actually had the intent like the the hill that I had, we'd picked was sort of facing east so I was like oh well, I just I'll cut myself a nice big open shelf. You know, there's no bad weather coming. I don't need that much protection and I'll be able to just, you know, I just need a bit of cover over the top of me and I'll be able to watch the sunrise over Charlotte's Pass. Was it open the full length then of of the bench? Not the full length, but it will have been like a, a metre and a half wide opening. So I could be laying down and just yeah, looking out over Charlotte's Pass and the main range. So how far away was the tent from the the cave it definitely was far enough that um the walk from the tent to the snow cave was a pain in the butt in the middle of the night <laughs> look, look, because james wanted to be camping on a slope and to throw his snow down the hill and we wanted to be on the flat bit um a little bit further away so that it, it was definitely more than 10 meters yeah you checked the forecast at charlotte's pass it looked like it was clear for you know the days ahead yeah you know like you said blue sky perfect conditions so what happened as the sun went down? What happened as, as it got darker? So it turns out we hadn't learnt our lesson about the wind. We once again had looked at the blue sky, no precipitation. This is going to be a lovely time. We set up our camps, went to bed, and I distinctly recall waking up at 1am with my tent flapping madly going, oh, the ruddy wind. And thinking to myself, gee, I wish I was in that snow cave right now because it would be warm and quiet. And um, I put in my earplugs and attempted to go back to sleep. And what about the land of Nod for you, James? How, how was it in the cave? Did you, did you fall asleep fairly easily? Yeah, I mean, I, ha- I was having a, a great sleep. So I didn't set any alarms to wake up because there was no forecast of snow. I, you know, I, I woke up a few times, like you, you, ro- you, you know, you roll over in bed and I sort of looked looked at the door, sort of peeked. Like I'd packed up my backpack to block the wind. And I remember sort of peeking past it and going, oh, yeah, I can still, I, th- I thought I could still see the night sky and, you know, roll back over. And I don't, know, I don't know how many times I would have done that, but at one, you know, at one point I stopped and I was like, I don't think, I don't think that that looked quite right. And I was sort of lying there thinking about it, and I was like, "Yeah, def- something's definitely not right." And I pulled my bag down, and it was just a wall of snow. That was there was no door there anymore. You said you you didn't set any alarm. Is that a normal thing to do in a snow cave? Good practice, I would say, is that you should have some sort of alarm system to to wake you up and. You're really setting that alarm based on how much snow you're expecting to fall, I guess. If it's a heavy snow night, you know, like an hour, you want to be sort of waking up every hour to check check on things. And that moment when you pulled your bag back and you just saw this wall of white, can you remember what was going through your head at that time? Uh, yeah, it was... 
it was it was all like the classic signs of shock and grief. You you just didn't I just didn't believe it. You I sat there looking at it going, Oh, that's a bit strange. There was a bit there was a little bit of a gap, you know, because obviously the snow doesn't make a perfect seal up against the roof of the door what you know, of what was the door frame. So you just I just pushed my hand in. It wasn't a doubt in my mind that I would push my hand into that gap and punch out into the into the real world and there wouldn't you know, that was, that would be the end of it. And then that didn't happen. And then you just you sit there in disbelief again and you go, Well that's a bit strange and I look around in the snow cave and I find my shovel and I I grab the, the handle of the shovel and I push that through the gap thinking not a doubt in my mind that it was just going to push through into the outside world and it didn't. The doorway that I'd cut, like the, the depth of the entry sort of between the snow wall and what was the snow wall in my sleeping area would have, would be less than, less than a metre plus a shovel. That's over a metre. So... I didn't think there'd be more snow than that. So when I did push, you know, my arm through and shovel handle through the depth that was the doorway, yeah, it was. I guess my brain wasn't comprehending what what situation I was in. And do you know what time this was? My my concept of time was so far out of whack. Like I, there's hours of that night that I cannot recall. Mm-hmm. And I, I did make a a, di- a journal, a diary entry when I was in the cave, and I probably would guess that that would have a timestamp on it. Maybe mm-hmm. I've actually never read that. Uh, I've never read that diary entry. I still have the book on the shelf, but the pages taped shut, so you, you can't accidentally open it. And what led you to to write in the journal? It was it was at the point where I'd where I'd given up. So after, yeah, after not punching through more with my hand, my next step was, okay, well, I'll get the shovel blade and put my, so- uh, put my shovel together and I started cutting out, you know, cutting the blocks, cutting blocks of snow out of the doorway and throwing them to the side of the snow cave and still in my sleeping bag at the moment. So, you know, I dug in about a metre of the depth of what the door used to be and you know, still hadn't made my way wow. out into the real world. And then I guess I progressed into the next step. I you know, got out of my sleeping bag. I put on a few more clothes and dug a little bit deeper. And there was a few, probably the thing I noticed actually was how short of breath I was mm. and how, how, how quickly I was, you know, how little effort was taking for me to become breathless. And, you know, this was at a time when I was probably the most fittest, the fittest I've ever been. Mm-hmm. Once you, once the oxygen gets below a certain level, you just you just pass out, and there's no there's no two ways about it, right? There's no there's no choice in the matter. It's just mm. oxygen gets to a level, and you shut down. And I had that I had that thought when I was sitting there breathing heavily. I felt like I wanted to stop and write something down because I didn't. I wanted to. I don't know what I wanted to do. I guess I wanted to say goodbye. And maybe explain, I don't know, explain the situation. I can't remember if I'd been, I can't remember if I'd gone through the angry phase by the time I did the journal entry. I remember being angry at Dylan. So talk me through those those emotions. So do you recall that they were changing? Yeah, big time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and especially, I don't remember if I recognised them in the moment, but I definitely recognised them like reflecting on the situation. And I can't remember what, like now I can't remember what order they came in, but I remember like after the fact, looking back at it and going like, that's just textbook, right? Like you went through all the, all the, all the exact emotions in the order they tell you you're going to go through them. I went through them. I was shocked. I was in disbelief. I was, I didn't, I was in denial. <laughs> I, was, I was angry. I was sad, you know, and that, that angry phase I don't think I don't remember it lasting very long, but I did get very angry at, at Dylan because I was like, if there's this much snow, his tent can't handle that much snow. Mm. Like he, he would have been out of his tent ten times. Like if, if he had the same amount of snow on him as I did, he would have he he that means he'd been out of his tent ten times to dig himself out and not once did he come and help me. That was you know, that was that was the angry phase. And meanwhile, Dylan 
with your earplugs in in the mega mid um, what was what was happening in your sleep that night myself and our friend in the tent with me um, were having a very windy night and my friend who was in the tent with me was fully dressed in their clothes inside their sleeping bag with all of their things packed in their bag because they were so worried that the tent was going to blow away. Um, it was that windy. And the reason that we didn't get out of our tent 10 times to take the snow off our tent is that where James had dug in his snow cave was in the lee of a slope. Um, we unfortunately were exposed to a lot of wind and so um, the snow didn't get a chance to settle on our tent. It um, just got blown straight off. So we were just copping it. And so there was no snow settling on our tent. Massive thanks for the support from the team at Paddy Pallon, who since 1930 have been leaders in travel and outdoor adventure. In fact, did you know that Paddy himself, a member of the Sydney Bushwalkers Club, was a volunteer in the original search and rescue arm of the Federation of Bushwalking Clubs in New South Wales? Hmm, nice one, Paddy. So, James, take us back into the cave. Just because I'm curious, what are the dimensions inside the original space that you'd dug out for yourself on this bench? Like the sleeping area, not including the doorway, and like a metre and a half wide, two and a half metres long, and enough room for like a metre and a half tall, so like enough room for me to sit up in. Not massive, I guess, like yeah, single person tent kind of size space. You'd started cutting out blocks, you'd said. Yep. You'd, you'd built your, your shovel and started cutting out those blocks and you were starting to feel the changes in the air and the taste and, and that. What Physicality-wise, you know, you've got this small space that you're working within. What do you do with the, the blocks and the snow that you're trying to cut out? Because you've got really nowhere to put it. What, what's that about? Yeah, once I'd, I would have been, I don't know, like a metre and a half or two metres, something in, into the doorway. Like that snow was taking up like probably a third, a third of this, like, you know, what was my sleeping area. Mm. And it was, snow was building up on all my, all my things, on my, mat- on my mattress, on my sleeping bag, on my backpack, on all my food and cooking equipment. Like everything was starting to get covered in snow pretty quickly. There was a, I distinctly remember going into that next next step of no one's no one but no one but you is getting you out of this situation. Mm. There is no one but you. you. You can't you can't stop. I guess essentially, like you can't you can't give up because mm. for whatever reason Dylan's not coming, and it's, you know you've got to keep going until you physically can't keep going anymore. So did you keep doing the same? Uh, strategy of trying to dig through what logically would fill the the quickest way out which would be the door there was two stages i guess the first stage i went back into was continuing to dig out but i reduced my basically the tunnel that i was digging to you know the width of a shovel blade tall and two shovel blades wide so it was like 30 centimeters by 60 centimeter tunnel i dug that out for probably another full body length so it's wow. my i'm 196 centimeters tall so wow two, and plus plus the out so my you know my arm reach plus mm. half a meter for a shovel so we're getting close to four meters that's how deep my tunnel had got and i still could not i still could not get out wow what i had become concerned about was was I now suddenly digging into another slope and now I was suddenly tumbling into the side of a hill instead of in, into the side of the next hill. So I I went looking for my ski poles. So I'd left my ski poles marking my entrance. So I knew they had to be somewhere in the snow, some give or take somewhere where the door used to be. So yeah, I found that I found a ski pole eventually and I got that ski pole and I drilled that all the way through the roof up to my, basically up to my shoulder. So that's you know, essentially three meters and it, and it popped, it popped out. And the, the feeling of that is a feeling I can't say I've ever experienced again in my life. And every emotion, like all the emotions just come rushing, 
come rushing into you. There was the the fresh dump of fresh air just coming straight in that hole. It was just yeah. Wow. <laughs> This is, I've never experienced a feeling like that feeling in, in that moment. And what changed for you in that moment? I was I was fine. The experience was over. Like crisis had been averted. <laughs> I was alive, and I you know I went into I, I don't know my brain just was just like I, I think I don't know I guess adrenaline probably was just this massive dose of adrenaline. I just took my shovel and I wildly swung at the roof and dug myself a vertical tunnel out of this little space uh which was unsuccessful because i'm not that tall and i couldn't climb out of my vertical shaft <laughs> so, and then of course all that you know all that snow that that tunnel vertical tunnel of snow just like landed all over my sleeping gear or my backpack everything and I, i've probably st- i think i stopped for a minute and was like all right it's okay james it's okay you've you know, we're out of this. We can calm down, slow down. But were you out of it yet? Because it- apparently not. <laughs> so you madly digging at the ceiling to uh, to widen that that vent hole that you'd screwed through and broken through. Do you have any concept of the time that that would have taken? No, not at all. No, I was half dressed. I think. I dug proper steps. I was like, "Take your time. You got time." Just dug steps out of that out of that hole. Yeah. I, I ran down to Dylan's tent and opened his tent and said, "Ah, oh, Dylan, I need a hand to get my stuff out of the tent. Can you come and help me?" Dylan, what's your memory of that that moment when James came knocking or shaking at the at the tent door? So. I hadn't been sleeping too well, and so it wasn't like he disturbed me from a deep slumber. But um, there was definitely the what on earth is this person doing unzipping our tent in the middle of the night, covered in snow and, and yeah, ice through his hair, beard, um, half dress, so wearing thermal top, um, rain over pants, you know, the older over the shoulder brace styles. And my recollection is what James said was, I'm, I'm glad to see you guys and can you come and help me get my stuff out of the cave? Our suspicion was um, that we, we had a brief moment after he said, you know, can you give me a hand? He, he ran off and we had an opportunity to talk amongst ourselves. And I went um, running. <laughs> to go get his gear and he was still crazy, still very like on a high and adrenaline and all those sorts of things. I dove, I dove head first down into my hole. <laughs> wow. So the, the, the hole that you'd just spent hours... <laughs> trying to dig out of you just dived headfirst back into yeah the uh the one thing i do remember was that on my student budget i bought a a very expensive sunto compass and i was like i was not i was not getting out of that hole until i found that compass (laughs) so tell me about the urgency and why why you were so fixated on getting the gear out and and why that was a focus at that time like i look back i look back now and my behaviour over this next 12 hours less, it's probably the most disappointed I've been in myself in my decision-making. In this moment, the near-death experience to me, it didn't register the significance, I guess, of the event, right? Like I'd lived this experience and I was thinking about where we were going to go skiing that day. Dylan was the one that talked me into going back to Charlotte's to check in and going home because this was a serious thing and we shouldn't be out in the middle of nowhere anymore. Can we step back just a little bit, um, thinking of all those electronics that you'd brought? I think there was a, a piece about the PLB. Uh, yeah, so at some point when I was in my cave, I had the PLB in my bag. That was the piece of equipment that I was carrying in the team. And I figured... This was a pretty serious situation and I didn't think it would work, but I turned it on just on the off chance that something did happen. You know, I don't know how often the beep was. It's not very often, maybe once every 10 seconds or at one point that beep just got to me. It was like too much of a reminder that you're you're in a a serious situation. Mm, So I, I turned it off. Dylan can probably attest 
to having a better memory of this, but I feel like I casually mentioned that to Dylan at one point, mm. like it was not, not a big deal. What I'm hearing is that even though on the outside it appears that, you know, emergency averted, it, it's finished, but it really, it really wasn't over yet, even though that immediate acute danger uh, my my concept of this is this is the biggest loss of of time that I experienced that that night was once I'd collected all my things out of out of the cave, I you know I came back down to the tent and kicking and screaming essentially they put me in a sleeping bag and gave me the warmest sweetest most amazing drink I've ever had in my entire life basically put me to sleep like put me you know told me to have a rest. Mm. And I think it I think that was the first time I felt my hair and realizing my hair was like a just a snowball. I couldn't fit my, my I couldn't fit my beanie on my head anymore. So Dylan, in your perspective then, tell us what was happening and and what did you and, and your other friend do when you saw James at your, at your tent door? So James came down and said, Jim, I'm glad to see you. Can you come and help me get my things out of my tent? Um, I, I was uh, effectively, I was buried alive. And we sort of, and, and he runs off to go start getting his things out of his tent. So we had a moment to sort of talk amongst ourselves and go, hang on a second, what, what's going on here? So I, I headed out. I said, James, you head back to the tent. I'll get your gear. Don't worry about it. And that's when he went back and put him in a sleeping bag and gave him a warm drink and started dealing with a, a person in shock effectively. And I started digging for James's gear and he recovered some of his items, but there was a few things that he said, you know, I'm still looking for X, Y, Z and whether that was another ski stock um, out of the two ski stocks or. No, I found my compass. <laughs> yes, found the compass. But there was a handful of items that he, you know, had a shopping list for me to go and get. And we came up with a plan for managing James, but also finding the gear and um, we took shifts digging and um, looking after James and coming up with a plan. And so we pieced together things like that a PLB had been set off um, and so that there might be some implications of that. Um, we pieced together that there was some critical equipment that we needed to get out. Um, and, um, yeah, so we started thinking about all the ways that we needed to address those things. I want to come back to you were saying we needed to manage James or we took turns to take care of James. And that seems like the kind of language that you'd use when there was a like a first aid incident or an emergency or something, someone becomes um, a patient. Was that something that you both recognised um, in James, that he, he actually needed some, some help and support and he probably wasn't aware of his, his situation? I don't know that either of us at that time were particularly able to articulate what those needs were. Um, we both certainly were very aware of the realities of um, hypothermia um, and also being, I guess, f freaking out about the possibility of having almost just died. Mm -hmm. um, can impact someone in in significant ways, and since then, obviously, I, I've thought a lot more about it and and got much more sophisticated thoughts about what was going on. Um, but we certainly knew that we were dealing with someone who um, needed to be looked after. So, as the sun was starting to come up, did that change what was happening for you guys internally and externally, James? For me, I honestly remember thinking about where we were going to ski that day. I feel like that was the f almost probably the first thing I asked Dylan about was, you know, whether we should go skiing on like Carruthers or Mount Twynham or Mount Northcote and being quite put out by the fact that Dylan wanted to call the adventure off. So Dylan, what was, uh, what was going through your head in terms of, of why you wanted to, to call it off? So James didn't know that we'd been having lots of conversations outside the tent while he was um, rugged up in his sleeping bag and catching up on some well-earned Zs. And knowing that we weren't too far off the end of our week out in the bush anyway, so we weren't going to lose too many days of um, valuable power power time, we had made the decision that it was it was time to go home and to go tell the emergency services that if you, by the way, if you picked up that PLB, it was us and we're okay. I do recall that eventually we all agreed that it was a good idea to go and um, head back to Charlotte's Pass. Um, there's a police station there. 
uh, and to go and let people know, um, particularly about that PLB, uh, about what was going on. I, I remember being annoyed, annoyed at Dylan for the rest of the day. Mm. And, and that, that affected the decisions that I made. And there was a lot of suggestions that Dylan made later on in the day, navigation decisions, terrain decisions, that I didn't, I didn't really respect his opinion at the moment. And that caused the group and myself to make worse decisions because I was, I was pushing back on his decisions and I was making, I felt like I made the worst decisions that day. And they were, they were still letting me make decisions. I was really angry at James. Mm. James didn't set an alarm, didn't clear his snow holes. We were in this mess because of James. I don't know when I started feeling those things, but I certainly remember having those similar feelings back in the other direction. It's interesting the that thing when someone needs assistance from those around them, there's, there's a real danger of feeling like your agency has been taken away from you, that decisions have happened external to you that you've not been a part of. And it's almost like there's, you know, there's these these other people who, you know, normally mean well and, and we're mates, but it feels like they're conspiring. It's really difficult when, when you are in the situation when you notice that someone does need assistance, how you manage the group and the tensions and the and different perspectives on things. And different capabilities. So I was by far and away still the least capable person in the snow in that group. Mm-hmm. Um, I certainly was a very capable outdoors person by now in terms of leadership and choices around things, but I still was the least capable on skis. And so that absolutely factored into um, how we proceeded for the rest of the day too. So you're in Charlotte's Pass and... You know, your friend is overwhelmed and, and starts crying with all of the stuff that's just happened in the last six hours. How does how does that make you feel, James? What what happened? What does she do next? In our sort of debrief, I guess, post post the event, you know, she had a huge amount of guilt that was coming upon her that she she also, you know, she didn't get out of the tent to check on us at any point during the night. She didn't think that I was in any kind of danger. And mm. my my understanding of her emotion in that moment was was guilt she was feeling incredibly guilty i think i think i told her she was being silly like you know i i hadn't grasped i hadn't grasped really the, the seriousness of the situation mm. that i was in that the group was in and <laughs> i just yeah, i probably even told her she was being silly and there's also just um the normal tiredness you know let alone the the emotional and the physical stuff that you guys had all been going through, and especially you, James. But from from the sounds of it, I think I had the most sleep out of anyone. <laughs> That's right, because you got put to bed. But um, <laughs> but yeah, everyone is has got lack of sleep. You, you guys are, are here before me today. You you appear still. You know, you appear to have a good relationship these days, even though you know it's now ten years down down the track since you've spoken, just because of the journeys of life. But Take me back to Charlotte's Pass. So, Dylan, you, you've you've gone into the into the police station there. What happened next? Uh, James was correct in that setting off the PLB um, hadn't worked in the snow cave and hadn't been picked up by anyone. And so, when we went into the police station and said, "Hey, we're the ones that set off the PLB," they're like, "What PLB?" And uh, there was no process to do anything. They weren't particularly interested in us. They didn't kind of check on us to see how we were going and whether we'd had a terrible experience and anything like that. And when I kind of tried to say it might be nice if someone could give us a lift, um, their suggestion was to go get the oversnow transport um, and then get back to our car at Dead Horse Gap some other way. But being poor students that we were and couldn't afford the oversnow transport, decided in our infinite wisdom that it would be a better idea for us to ski from Charlotte's Pass back to Dead Horse Gap that day um, rather than uh, make that other paid pilgrimage that we couldn't afford. How long would that journey normally take in, in good conditions when you're feeling strong and fit and everything's, you know, everything's going good for you, James? Yeah, it's like somewhere between 12 and 13 kilometres, something like it's depending on how much zigzagging you end up doing with multi-day like you know massive packs on and the skis and gear that we were on like 
that's that's a that's a, that's a big day. Mm. Like that, that just that activity itself is a big day. Surely, like four or five hours of skiing, and we'd already skied about ten kilometers from Blue Lake to Charlotte's Pass that morning, um, and effectively been up since three thirty four thirty a.m. Um, looking for gear in the snow, looking after people. So you've saved your pennies. I, I actually re- I reflect on that decision like as a parent now, and you're just like, how how did it not cross my mind? To call my my mom and dad and say I need two hundred dollars to get to my car. Like there is like there is no scenario as a parent now where I wouldn't do that. Answer that phone call and find out a way to get my children, you know, out of that situation. I didn't ask for help because I didn't think I needed help. You know. Well, even you know, on on reflection, thinking of all the other options that might have even been available to you like you know your TAFE teachers may actually were they still in Jindabyne or you know all sorts of different people who you know if given the the opportunity to help out you know probably would have jumped at the chance but you know this is this comes back to that decision making kind of you know thing when when everything's buzzing and you know operating at a different path and a different speed to normal you say you say to calling your te- TAFE teachers like honestly in eight, like in I hadn't even thought of that as an option until you just said that right then like the local TAFE teacher like he lived in Jindy he probably could have made one phone call and put us on a on a over snow vehicle because his mate drove the over snow vehicle like how did I you know eighteen years later and that's the first time I thought of that I didn't even think of it you thought of it like how was that not a decision we made Dylan like I don't, you know, I'm absolutely same boat. I think for me, I just I didn't realize that I needed help. You know, like I didn't I didn't call anyone because I didn't think we needed help. I thought we were fine. I agree with that. I absolutely agree that we were in the mindset that we were self evacuating, and it was only because we were being cautious. We weren't in trouble. She'll be right. Yeah, it was just a long walk home to the car now. Do you have a personal story about an incident or rescue during an outdoor trip when something didn't quite go to plan? Maybe you got lost, injured, let down by some gear, preparation or something else. Look, honestly, it can happen to any of us at any time, regardless of how experienced we are. And it's by sharing these stories and tales that we can all learn and help to avoid them in the future. So if that's you, I'd love to hear from you. So please drop me an email to rescued at lotsoffreshair.com. That's rescued with a D. So tell me about that long walk back to the car that you said even, you know, on a good day would have been a a big day if everything was, you know, normal. I remember um, not having fun. I remember having um, very sore feet from um just being on skis for prolonged kilometers in either super icy conditions or super poor conditions where you're falling through the snow and continually making poor decisions because our bodies and brains were so tired and when poor decisions by the route that we take in the first place but then our ability to actually navigate on that route um and then our ability to make, um, to recognize when we were making poor decisions and to fix them before they got worse. The short version is that we we didn't do any of those things and it just kept getting worse. What, you know, so leaving Charlotte's Pass, I mean, the first thing you're going to do is get out of Charlotte's Pass. So that's its own little bowl. And, you know, I thought we had a win. We managed to talk the lift into letting us go on the lift for free to get out of the bowl. He's like, yeah, beautiful. It's like one hill, tick, first hill, tick. And from there, I mean, it's it's just a long, flat slog. You know, you, we get to the top of Threadbow and we were aiming for we were aiming for a ridge that one of the ridges, one of the two ridges that feeds down to Dead Horse Gap. And, you know, this is where I remember challenging and ignoring Dylan's decision-making we had a we had a choice very early on to we didn't have enough elevation to make the top of the ridge not by much but we just didn't have enough elevation and again you sort of go back to that even at the top of threadbow we could have skied down the threadbow resort and hitchhiked the rest of the way to the car even that decision we didn't make that decision because 
someone would have to hitchhike and it would be a nightmare. We've got to like gear, we've got to like skis, we wouldn't, you know, no one's going to pick us up. So for people who don't understand what you mean by didn't have enough elevation to get up onto the ridge. Yeah, so the types of ski that we were using, they're, because they're like a lightweight backcountry ski with a telemark binding. So they're kind of halfway between like a what you'd see a cross-country racing ski in the Olympics and like a downhill resorts ski. So they've got shape to them like a, res- like a resort ski would, but they're light and they're not very good at skiing downhill with. And these ones have got the skis we had like have a, like a pattern base to them. So they have a little bit of grip that can walk up the snow up uphill, but they don't have a lot of grip. So you can't walk up very steep slopes. So yeah, we, we'd got to the start of this ridge and we were, We'd lost too much height, I guess, to stay on top of the ridge. And once you, if you're on top of the ridge, you can, you know, it's easier to follow the path down the hill. Whereas once you're on the side, the terrain tends to be a lot steeper. The trees develop faster. It's easier to take the wrong spur and end up in a different feature than the one you want to be on ultimately. Mm, understand. So... Without even realizing it, you're making decisions just through your actions that were going to affect, you know, the rest of the day. How did you eventually get to your car and what was those last five Ks like or the last three Ks like? What happened? So we had, we had, I remember we had a choice. We had to either climb up maybe 50 meters of elevation, like vertical height to get on top of the ridge, or we had the option of, essentially you call it traversing where you just try to maintain as much height as you can with but still sort of moving forwards and you know instead of walking that 50 meters up we i pushed dylan in i feel like i pushed dylan into the decision that we should just traverse and hopefully we can traverse well enough to get back on top of the ridge and we never did and we got further and further away from that top of the ridge instead of getting closer and the train kept getting steeper and steeper to a point where our skis were no longer capable of going uphill anymore. And so then the only choice is to keep going down and it just gets steeper and the, you know, you're in the Australian bush now and you start, the snow starts getting thinner, the bush starts getting thicker real quick, gets so steep that you can't ski anymore and we're falling over with 20, 30 kilo backpacks on and falling into the snow and you can't get back on your feet again and you know at some point you just it's too steep and there's not enough snow to ski and there's too much snow to walk so you you basically you take your skis off and you just start trying to fall and collapse through the snow and the bush and just plod downhill and i mean by this stage it must have been four o'clock in the afternoon i wasn't talking to anyone (laughs) i don't remember much conversation happening everyone knew that i feel like you know i feel like i knew that there was no way to get on the ridge anymore and the only option was to go down like i mean that's that's the situation we were in the only option was to go down and get to the creek and get to the road and and find our car you're at the cars You've made it at the cars. Are, are you guys, are you all still talking to each other or is it, you know, the grunts and the, just the nods and the what, whatever's next to do? Dylan, do you want to talk to that? What ended up happening for most of that late afternoon was that we each had ebbs and flows of um, the brain kicking back in for a moment or not. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there were some poor decisions made, but um, I don't want anyone to leave this conversation thinking that James is the only one making poor decisions because it was a team effort um, and we did very good at making those t- poor decisions together um, in lots of different ways. But um, when we did eventually hit the road, um, we weren't near the car um, and we had to walk in our ski boots along the road. And so that was one of the times when I feel like I was actually making some good decisions and I made the decision, it was my car, and I said, you guys wait here and I'll boot along the road to the car and come back and um, pick you up. So I didn't have a heavy backpack, but I still had very uncomfortable shoes. 
and that was it. That was that was finally um, once the car started and I ambled down the road a few kilometres to pick them up. Um, that was our journey back into town, which was silent but not tense. It, it, there wasn't a lot of chat, but um, uh, there wasn't any. It was mostly reflection. And that evening when we got back to, we, we went and checked into a caravan park and slept in our tents again that night. But the caravan park had a, like a communal room that we could sort of hang out in with a, um, a, a drying room for our gear and a fireplace we could sit around and being the middle of the week and not many people around, we had the space to ourselves and had um, a lot of time to chat and reflect. And it was actually a really positive conversation to learn from each other. It was really valuable. It, it kind of sounds like, you know, those outdoor leadership things where at the end of a, an activity or a program, you, you have the, you know, the group debrief moments. And, it, and I wonder if, if maybe you guys hadn't been, you know, um, outdoor leadership students, but just socially out there, if you actually would have had that kind of a, let's talk this out, let's, let's debrief what's just happened. I do remember actually this topic being covered like as part of, you know, of one of the courses was the importance of having that that debrief at the end of an, uh, you know, a significant event mm-hmm. like this. And, you know, I, I wouldn't have, without having have done that course, I wouldn't have thought to, you know, have the importance of having that debrief at, at the, at the end of that. Can you remember some of the things that, that you spoke about in terms of the takeaways and, and the learnings for all of us, not just in a, in a snow environment, but uh, in all of our, adventures and and moments that we step off the concrete into the wild stuff for me it was really getting a sense of what the other people had gone through that day right and how their experience had differed from mine and having being told that not interrupting just listening to to their story and not making i guess any judgment or anything like that like you're just trying to listen and appreciate what 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 they went through on that day, in that moment, and Dylan, what about you in terms of the the forum for for talking about it? How do you reflect on that experience of actually just being able to share about it? Telling stories about those experiences, this one and and other experiences in my life, have always been a great way to process those things that have gone on. But I'll, I'll, I'll absolutely reiterate that in that particular evening, the fact that we did such a good job of just listening. Um, and not interrupting and telling each other stories. I don't remember much of the details, but I absolutely remember feeling like each of us was heard and had an opportunity to speak. And there were lots of silences too. Um, It was an odd one. But then bringing it out to a bigger picture and a longer term sort of learnings, there's been so many things that have um, on reflection come back to go, hang on, if I was to... Um, do this again or tell someone about what I wish that I'd known then that there there are so many things that I I think that I would wish for people and and the the if I had to pick one thing though the one thing that I'd want to share with people out of this is that you can have all the gadgets in the world and all the um, perceived support networks in the world and all those sorts of things but in the end it really comes down to the capabilities that you have within yourselves and within your your immediate group when it comes to dealing with those um, really bad times in the outdoors, that all those other things, even when they do work, are secondary to that role that each of you plays in those things. And we were very fortunate that we were all very capable people in the outdoors, that that experience that we had um, that we got off so lightly. If we were to look at, and you talked about, you said just one thing, if you could pick just one thing, Dylan, but there's so many amazing things that we can all learn and take away from the experience, James, that you had and the experience, Dylan, that you've had, which is, as you said, quite different. What are some of those other things for you, James, that you took away and it might have been, you know, not, right at that period of time it might have been you know months down the track or even years down the track there's been a a couple of things recently that i've been thinking about with some friends talking about you know skiing adventures and you know having adventures but 
there's a couple of friends that have this real reluctance to to call for help or ask for help, and that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense to me. Mm. And like I've been wondering if you know an experience like this or some other ones that I've been in, I have no reservation about ask, asking for help. You know, even as a parent now, you, like you think about these you know, these situations that you've been in, you know, I love the outdoors and I would have no dramas with them loving the outdoors and wanting to go on adventures. And it's like, how do I, how do I prepare them to make good decisions? What about some other learnings, Dylan? I think it's really important to have the support networks, the backup plans, letting people know where you go, having the right equipment, all those sorts of um, making sure the event you choose is, um, you know, within the realm of feasibility for your skill set. But things are going to go wrong every now and then, uh, and that's okay. But to keep having adventures that mm. um, that I'm a firm believer that the experiences that we have in the outdoors are a great teacher for other things in life. Um, and so I'd hate to see people either um, personally choosing not to go and have outdoor adventures or our society shifting to a place where um, outdoor adventures are frowned upon because every now and then someone needs assistance. And, um, yeah, I think that for me that that experience in the snow was one of those ones where um, we learn a lot and it made me a way better um, guide, risk manager, leader um so many layers out of that um in terms of being able to to see what's coming but also deal with stuff when it does come james if people took away one thing from your story what would you want them to take away i guess not underestimating the impact that an event is going to have on 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 a person whether it's you know you or someone else in the group it's finding i guess finding a way to recognize the significance of an event that you've been through and giving yourself time to process, you know, I guess what's happened. Do you think 18 years is long enough to process, mate? Well, yeah, yeah. I, last year, I went and stayed in a snow cave a kilometre from basically where this adventure went down with a friend. It's not the first time I've been in a snow cave. It's probably only been the second time I've been in a snow cave since that incident. But, I mean, this was, you know, it was literally in the same area, right? Like, yeah, I definitely set an alarm to check my door. That's for sure. Honestly, both of you guys, thank you so much just for just being humble enough to share the story because it's a big one. Like so many people, they're not willing to talk about it. Like some people are not willing to, to ask for help. But stories are, are the way we do learn. It was a doozy. Thank you so much for your willingness to share. And um, I'm really happy to hear that you are still and have been sleeping in snow caves. A bench, not a coffin, Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> the Rescued Podcast is produced on the unceded lands of the Gundungurra and Darug people of the Blue Mountains of New South Wales. I pay my respects to Elders past and present and acknowledge their enduring connection to and care for country. Special thanks to our sponsors, Paddy Powell. This has been a Lots of Fresh Air production.